Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Comic Arts Workshop. My name is Ramon Gill. I'm the organizer. We've been doing this, I think, since 2017. Um, we were doing it live in Chelsea for a long time. And then COVID happened. And then we went online. And it worked out because now we can have people from outside of New York City as, as guests and as attendees. So we've been getting attendees from, from all over the world sometimes. Um, and... Uh, be, before the Zoom, I it wasn't recording any of them, but now that we ha we're doing it on Zoom, we're able to record it. And the very, very first one was with Fabrice Sop Sapolsky, and I just realized that he actually he recorded it and and posted it online. So actually, if you go back to our to that to my Ramongil Comics dot com, uh, you go to the media page, you'll find some Fabrice's interview at the very bottom. So, anyways, tonight we are very honored to have. Um, two people who are in the business and who can talk about breaking in the business because breaking in has been a regular question on these on on our meetup so we have Ben Harvey who is an illustrator and he's done work for most of the major publishers and I met Ben years ago I can't remember what comic con it was but we were I think years ago yeah it had to be maybe like New York Comic Con or something Ramon no I, I feel like it was one of the New Jersey cons or oh, maybe could have been, yeah could it have been SPX. Were you at SPX? Either uh, don't think SPX, SPX or Baltimore. Yeah, um, one of those two. And then Jana, I've been getting emails from Jana because I joined her on uh, Kids Comics Unite, and um and uh, David Sailor over at Scholastic spoke very highly of you. So um so here we are. So we're going to be we're going to be asking questions from these two experts. So um, let's get and everybody before we get started, please everybody just show some love and give a round of applause to our two guests. <laughs> I sub I I sent them questions ahead of time, and then halfway through we are going to take questions from you guys. So, me. So our first question is: Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is in education, um, or what training you got to prepare for this career? Uh, should I take, I take Jana first, or? Sure, go ahead, Jana. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jana Morishma. I'm a literary agent, and I'm also the founder of an online community called Kids Comics Unite. Um, I focus mainly on graphic novels as an agent. I have a couple of clients who are not exactly graphic novelists, but the vast majority of them are. Um, and how did I get into this career? Well, I got started in graphic novels back in like 2003 or 2000. Yeah, around that time, because I got my first job in publishing at Scholastic and I was the assistant to the creative director for trade publishing at Scholastic, who was David Saylor. That's who you were just mentioning. Um, so he was my first boss in publishing. And while I was working for him, we got this idea to start a graphic novel imprint and we presented it to the publisher and she ended up giving it the green light. And so I was one of the founding editors of the graphics imprint. Um, so that's, that. it goes way back, but then I my career went through many twists and turns. Um, I worked at Diamond Book Distributors for a while. I worked at um, the New York City Department of Education on a literacy initiative for a while. And I also left publishing completely for a while. Um, and let's see, I, I while I was working for the Department of Education, I started freelance editing. And that is um, how I kind of eventually found my way into becoming an agent. Okay, Ben? Yes, uh, I am Benjamin Harvey, or Ben Harvey, um, as I'm known online. Uh, I work primarily for a uh, comic book uh, outlets here in the U.S., um, a few of them overseas. Um, I have been branching out recently into the world of video games and trading card art. Um, I kind of got my start uh, doing uh, comics, um, originally manga, uh, way back in the uh, Tokyo Pop days, like 100 years ago, if anybody remembers what Tokyo Pop is. Um, and then... Uh, was doing assistant work there and the entire time I was kind of like you know keeping my feet wet in comics uh on and off um 
And then recently, uh, in the past five or six years or so, I got a break into uh, uh, IDW, uh, doing some uh, turtle work with them, Ninja Turtle work. And uh, the rest is history. I've been uh, doing comics full time uh, for the past uh, five or six years. I've kind of lost count at this point. So, yeah. What are some of the other titles you worked on besides Ninja Turtles, Harvey? Oh, um, at this point, um, X Men. I've done work on. Um, it's hard. I have to kind of like <laughs> go back to my like mental like uh, Instagram you, wall. I think you were on Transformers. Yeah. Uh, no, not Transformers. No, not yet. Um, Wolverine. I'm doing work on Wolverine. Um, doing some work right now on a Doctor Doom book. Uh, I'm doing some work on a Avengers book. Uh, the list kind of goes on and. You know, I hope that list uh, diversifies more as I go down the pike. Okay. Um, the reason why I asked both Ben and Jana to do this particular topic with us is because um, there are two distinct uh, communities or industries in comics. You know, uh, we have the direct market people, which is DC, Marvel, Image, right? Dark Horse, those guys. And though there are a lot of creator-owned books in uh in, in a lot of the independent uh, publishers like Image and Dark Horse and IDW and things like that, there's a lot of work for hire that goes on over there too. Almost all of DC and Marvel are work for hire. So that is a very distinct way of doing business uh, as a comic book creator, it's work for hire. And that's the perspective that I'm hoping Ben will be able to bring to us tonight. And on the other side, we have Jana, who works primarily with traditional publishers who, who publish graphic novels, and almost always it's a it's a creator owned, um 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 sort of business model where the authors own the rights to all the, all the work, and then they license it out to the publishers, and in the direct market, I'm not sure, but in the past, they haven't really used agents. It was sort of like just you know you each creator trying to build relationships with editors, whereas in the publishing world. You know, uh, more often than not, a creator has to work with usually usually works with an agent, and the agent presents the work to publishers and tries to get get publishers to uh to 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 buy the work. So just a little aside. So now my next question is um <clears throat> I touched on it. What is the contract like for for you guys for in your industries, or at least in Jan in your case, what are the contracts like for your clients, the creators? Yeah, well, I'm super curious to hear what Ben Harvey has to say. <laughs> um, well, with my clients, uh, like you explained it really well, Ramon, the difference between the direct market and the book market. Um, my so, <laughs> <laughs> so when I am pitching my client's work to publishers um, and they're getting an offer from the publisher, it is not a page rate. They're being offered an advance against royalties. And so... The way the publisher decides how much money to offer in their advance against royalties has nothing to do with how long the book is or how difficult it is to do um, or anything like that. It is entirely based on what they think the sales could be for that book, which again is complete conjecture. And many times they're very, very wrong, <laughs> but they still do it that way. Um, so they might say, okay, we'll give you an advance of $20,000 against royalties, you know, and then they'd have a hardcover royalty rate and a um, paperback royalty ebook e rate, blah, 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 down the line. Um, so I think that's pretty different than the way it would work in the direct market. But Ben, you can tell me. <laughs> hey, Jana, can I can ask you a question. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? What, can you explain sales against royalties? The advance against royalties. Advance against royalties. So basically an advance against royalties, it's kind of like a loan, but it's a non-repayable loan. So when they are advancing $20,000 for you to create a graphic novel, um, and then once they start selling the graphic novel, they're re recouping that advance. So once they have sold enough copies that your royalty rate has earned out, they are going to start paying you royalties. So if if your portion of the overall sales of the book reaches twenty thousand dollars, 
you will then start receiving royalties and you'll receive royalties as long as the book remains in print. And what percentage would you say of creators actually get to that burn point? out burn out yeah uh well industry wide i forget what the percentage is but it's not it's less than 50 percent, significantly less so less than 50 percent of creators get their advance but they get they usually they sometimes don't get much else no, 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 no they you always get your advance unless the the publisher cancels the contract they will pay you the advance but Less than 50% get an advance and then get nothing else. Get royalties, after. yes. Right. Less than 50% uh, actually get royalties into the future because they never earn out. So I saw this, this um, this I guess it's a meme, and it broke down the advance for a creator, and let's say 20,000, but then they give you like um, three years to finish the book, right? So that's so you have to live off twenty thousand over three years, and they don't even give you the twenty thousand at the beginning, right? Correct. So they'll give you like one third at the beginning, maybe, and one third halfway, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. or based on what you deliver, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So that's what you have to think about when you tough. When you're, <laughs> you know, and yeah. Uh, in terms of um, the, just as a to give you some concrete numbers, um. I have sold, you know, a fair amount of graphic novels now since I first started, um, which was about five years ago. And the smallest advance that I have received for a full length graphic novel was about $3,500. And the largest advance that I've received was $100,000. And they were both, both the $3,500 advance and the $100,000 advance was basically the same amount of work. The same length of a book. But you, wow. There's never been a. <laughs> you really set your prices for your graphic novels really high. Uh, have you ever had an advance that was zero? I haven't, no, but you know, working with, if you were working with a small indie publisher, it's possible that they could give you a deal where it's, it's only based on royalties and there's no advance up front. Does that mean that you would start getting royalties right away if they sold the if they were able to sell the book? Yes, yes, that is what it would mean. Got it. Okay. So now let's take that question and, and bring it to heart to, to Ben. Uh, um, can you briefly describe what a contract is like in the in the direct market arena? Sure. Um, I haven't signed many uh, contracts in the uh, direct market, um, but I have been uh, recently. Um, and it's kind of coincidence that you bring this up now at this point, um, sign a contract with uh, Marvel. It's a, uh, it really depends on, you know, it kind of works the same way in uh, Jenna's world. Um, in uh, the, the, it works the same way in my world is that, you know, it depends on how far up the totem pole you are in popularity, where their numbers are, where they see you going, you know, do they see you selling, you know, every single book you're on, out in the next year or are you kind of like inconsistent so uh it's a, it's a page rate right uh um, yes it's a page rate yeah it's not really don't I, I mean i've there may be advances in <laughs> in the direct market i'm not sure i haven't heard of any um but yeah it's a page rate uh they, they want to you know typically they want to lock you in by your time out for the you know for what however long the contract is set say it's like a year or two years um you know, it goes to show that they, they see something in your work and um, they would like to invest in it. Um, and so, yeah, outside of the direct market, I just kind of like diversify the the scope of the things that I've signed before. Um, as far as like things saying like video games or like hard art or things like that, they just kind of want to make sure that they're protected against you and you're not, you know, going to run away with their time or their money. Um, and it kind of like your, your rights are you know, very limited too. It's like, you know, like every entertainment industry, it's a work for hire. They own whatever you make. Um, and you have very little rights on the back end of that. Um, depending on what kind of, you know, maybe I should get like an attorney or something like that to look at this stuff so I can get better <laughs> contracts under my name signed, you know? Uh, so, yeah. The page rate, Ben, um, do they pay to, they, do they pay you after the work is completed or is there any kind of uh, upfront 
Um, yeah, I think, in the, you know, I mentioned like the advances, uh, there might be advances in, in the direct market. I'm not sure. I haven't heard of anybody getting advances. Um, it might be very rare these days. Uh, but yeah, for me personally, it is a per cover, uh, rate, you know, you turn your thing in and Friday you get your, your paycheck. Got it. Okay. That's so that's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and I should mention in terms of contracts, an, another key difference between, uh, the work for hire type contract versus or an agreement versus a tr book market contract would be that when you're the creator, you own all the rights. So you would retain, no, right. as an agent, normally I, my clients always retain their film and TV rights and they retain merch rights and, um, the, the who who's going to be in control of the foreign rights is a whole discussion with the publisher. Um, so yeah, that's a big difference too. You know, uh, it's not on, on the list of questions I sent you, but how how long from the time you finished the the, the book from to the time it gets published usually? Um, uh, at least a year for my most of the projects that I work on. Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer. Got it. Okay. Ben? I'm sorry, so repeat that question one more time, Ramon? From the time you've, you submitted your finished work, when does it hit the shelves? How long does it take usually? Oh, um, direct market, uh, it could be anywhere from like a month to six months to like a year sometimes. Um, yeah. And you're almost always working on about, what, 20 pages? 22 pages? I uh, In direct market comics, yeah, it could be anywhere from 20 to 24 pages. Um, I'm not really, I don't do really interior work, but, you know, on average, yeah, for an interior artist, it's about 20, 24 pages. Do you, um, do you pencil and ink? Uh, yeah, if I'm doing covers, um, I'm everything. So I paint everything top to bottom. Yep. So um, I'd love to hear about how you, okay, how you, you broke into comics. I mean, I know Jana worked at Scholastic, at at Scholastic and sort of like that was a more traditional way of, of getting into the industry. But uh, Ben, how, how did you get in? Uh, I mentioned before my, my intro that um, I had interned uh, for years. Um, and before that, I had like a mentor that kind of kept me wrangled into the <laughs> the comic industry because he was doing uh, comics as a, as a freelancer, as a self-published freelancer. Um, oh, and I looked up to him. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I was very fortunate to have met him at a very young age. I couldn't have been more than maybe eight years old, maybe not even out of grade school yet. Um, and then from then on out, yeah, I had like an internship with an artist. Uh, we worked for Tokyo Pop. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, so, eight years old. That's that's young to find your mentor. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So, um. I know a lot of people who, who I've heard a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people who get a professional gig back into the, into the comics they, field. Yeah. But then they don't get anything else for a long time, if ever. So uh, how, I mean, Ben, you've been working pretty consistently since I've met you. So how do you make sure that you don't have any dry spells? Uh, you just keep, keep trudging forward. You know, if you have a dry spell, then it's just more time for you to do something else. You know, um, there will always be dry spells. Promotion? Do you like do anything, any kind of outreach to editors and publishers? Oh, yeah. I mean, if yeah, you're you're breaking in, of course. Yeah. Um, you have to put the, the legwork in and um, go to shows. Yeah, you're putting in the legwork right now. Uh, as of right now, no, it's the, the I'm in a pretty good spot right now. But, you know, before I would go to New York Comic Con, you go to the big shows and just kind of, you know, tap the editors on their shoulders. You know. when, you got your, when you got your first uh, professional job, did you get another one right away after that, or was there a, was there a break? No, no, no. Yeah, there was a big lapse um, between the first one and the, the subsequent ones. I'd say about like a year or two. And again, it's like it's just knocking on doors, you know, keeping your feet to the pavement. Yeah. Because I think the, a lot of a lot of aspiring creators think that once they break in, that's it, right? In no. <laughs> yeah. It really depends on who you are. I mean, some people are just like, you know, very fortunate to get in and then there's just the work just explodes. But sometimes you get in and the work doesn't hit right away and you kind of have to keep moving or keep improving, you know. Jenna, 
Yeah, I would say um, definitely keep putting yourself out there. You basically, that part of, you can never stop. <laughs> you just have to keep keep doing that. So do you also, have clients who've gotten uh, a deal for, for one book and then not get a deal for a long time again after that, after, after yes, one book? Yes, it does happen. Yes. Um, yes. I think... And what, and what can they do to sort of alleviate that? Well, like Ben said, I think working on personal projects and continuing to put your personal work out there, um, either via social media or going to shows, showing your work at shows, um, sending a, like a PDF portfolio to editors or art directors, agents, um, just any any avenue you can figure out to just keep shipping, <laughs> I think is part of it. I also think um, you don't want to underestimate how important it is to be easy to work with. I think that that makes an impression. If you uh, meet your deadlines and you're um, easy to talk to and you um, are amenable to editorial revisions, um, all of those things people notice. Um, so it's very common to miss deadlines um, in, in my part of the world. Um, maybe not so much Ben for you because you're, you know, you're work for hire, but when a lot of my clients are taking on their own personal project and let's say it's like 250 or 300 pages, oftentimes they're overly optimistic about how long it's going to take them to finish, you know, a 250 page full color graphic novel for the first time. Um, but so there, I feel like communication is so key. Like don't realize like, oh my God, I'm gonna miss my deadline. So I'm gonna go hide in a hole and pretend it's not happening. Cause that does happen. <laughs> um, it's much better to talk to people. Um, and then I think being part of the community, that's also something um, you shouldn't underestimate. Uh, being friends with fellow creators you would be surprised how much um, I think agents end up working with clients because of word of mouth. I, I suspect that most clients get the majority of their cl their clientele from word of mouth, not from cold submissions that come in through email or whatever. Um, and then the, the final thing I just want to mention is um, prioritizing your mental health because it's a really tough industry. And I think, um, yeah, there's just, it, it, it's a real slog. Um, so again, sort of going back to the community, that's where having friends who can help you when you get really down is so important. You know, you mentioned yeah. community. How would you describe, what, what can a person do to be, to have that community? Or what do you mean by community? Oh, community can mean different things to different people because people are so different. You know, some people are introverted and ju they just need a, a couple of people in a small critique group that they belong to or just friends they hang out with on a regular basis. Um, and then other people are, you know, part of SCBWI. Well, in my world, it's a society of children's book writers and illustrators, um, or maybe they're really active volunteering at a local comics festival or um, maybe they start their own meetup for cartoonists or whatever. There's just all different ways you can do it. So it kind of depends on your own personality and what feels good to you. Got it. Ben, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah. I just want to add, like, reinforce everything she just, uh, Jenna just said. Um, it really, it works like any other entertainment industry. Um, nine times out of ten, you aren't submitting a resume to anybody to hear back from somebody. It's usually... A, or editor, you know, recognizing your face or your work and uh, when to take a chance on you, you know. Um, so, yeah, friends do come in handy uh, keeping your, you know, when I, when I kind of got into this industry, I had um, some students of mine or colleagues uh, ask, you know, how, how can I get in? Can I get your editor's email? And um, it's funny because I asked the same question <laughs> years ago. Uh, another artist who had broken in. It's like, can I get the editor's email? Can I email him my work? And um, that's, always, that's always a, a difficult situation. 
Yeah, they don't want to give it up because like those editors are usually pretty busy. They don't want to hear from somebody they don't know. Another yeah. thing they have to do on top of what they have to do already. So it's always best to just take the traditional route again, make friends, show your face it shows, on and on. You know, it's funny. Um, um, years ago, um, Greg Pack uh, shared on a panel to uh, to make build relations with 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 your peers, with people who are at the same level as you, because the the creators who are ahead of you have their own circle of friends that they will refer and they will go to to you know when they need something. So you need to. To so you need to build relationships with the people who are at the same level as you said. As you all go up the ladder, you can all help each other out. You know, he said that you will get more opportunities from your peers than from people. You know, um, ahead of me. And I have to say, I have to say that's been true for me as well. Uh, and then one thing that Jenna said earlier was that um, be amenable to editorial revisions. You know, I had an editor once uh, told me when I came back and I saw him like a year later that, so last year he told me to do the work on this, work on this, work on this. And he was really, he he said that, you know, uh, this is really good because most people will not, mm -hmm. will not follow the, the feedback, you know, or they'll show the same thing over and over again. And, and the editors will remember when somebody who showed them the same work a year before, and they'll remember when somebody actually, you know, um, followed their feedback. So along those lines, um, when Jenna said that, you know, be easy to work with, what are some absolute don'ts uh, in this industry that you shouldn't do if you're trying to work in it? So Ben, do you have any, any? <laughs> uh, yeah, just, you know, it's funny. It goes back to, to dovetail back into what Jenna just said you know, be easy to work with, you know, don't be, a, you know, I'll be hard-headed with, uh, in the world of direct marketing, don't be hard-headed with your work um, when you're working on a project. Be willing to take criticism. It's not that, you know, if somebody shoots back, an editor shoots back a, a criticism, they want you to change something. It's not because they hate you, not because they think your art is garbage. It's they want to see what you're doing be better. They want you to be better, They're, you know. Um, so yeah, just you know, be easy to work with. Uh, don't stick in your room the whole time. <laughs> don't stay stay home the whole time. I guess it's the best better way to put it. Uh, get out of your house. I know a lot of artists like myself. I mean, for me personally, I've been here all day. I haven't left the house. I need to get out after I have this meeting because um, I've been working all day. Um, as an artist, you have to get out of the house, and meet people, and build those social skills. Uh, that's one thing that can kill your career is. Uh, not being a social person and you know um You're having really bad else. social skills <laughs> yeah exactly you have to build those skills so so crucial in any industry and you know it's across the board um build those social skills um and yeah uh, i can't really think of anything else on top of my head you know um maybe not another thing too is like uh kicking yourself in the butt and not practicing enough you know it's easy to be caught up in like promoting yourself and like you know trying to get into these shows and like that, but you have to, you know, put the work in too. It's all a balance, you know, and I'm sure uh, Jenna could like attest to that too. I think she brought that up is life is all about balance. You have to kind of keep everything in check, but, um, but yeah, Jenna, uh, Jenna, you have anything else you want to add to that? Yes, I do. Um, don't rely solely on social media for your online presence and do have a website. I get so frustrated when I find 100%. creators who have no website. And it's, I actually just had lunch yesterday uh, with Kirk Bensoff, who's the creative director for First Second. And I don't remember how we got on the subject, but we got on the subject of artists who don't have a website. And we were both like, no, why, why? <laughs> so you, you got to have a website. And you don't have to build it from scratch. There are, there are companies out there that will provide website templates. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I go to, uh, mine is on, on something called Carbon Made. Mm -hmm. And just upload your images, and if you choose the 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 layout, and it works fine. So yeah. So one other tip is, um, when you are submitting your work to either an agent or to an editor or an art director, if they are interested in whatever the piece is that they're looking at, 
what is one of the first things that they're going to do? It's Google you. And so you should Google yourself and see like, what are they going to find when they Google your name? Oh, that's a good idea. I never thought of it that way. But I already Google myself all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, what uh, what Ben was saying earlier, uh, and I'll say it more directly, don't be an asshole. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. There's a guy on Facebook, David Campiti, who, who runs Glasshouse Graphics, and he loves to just complain about creators who approach him and he gives them either some feedback or whatever, and they, they turn into assholes, you know? So, <laughs> you know, the last thing you want to be known in this, it's a very small community. Everybody knows each other, you know? Um, so it's the last thing you want is to have a reputation of being an asshole. So, so, so sorry for, for the choice words there, but it's true. It's like everybody sort of knows each other or everybody's somewhat connected, you know? So, so make sure you you have a nice repu a reputation of being nice and, and, and easy to work with and meet your deadlines. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to turn it over to the audience, okay? Um, so people have been talking about the death of, com of the comics industry for decades now, and we can't deny that it's in, cha in a change. And, you know, a few years ago, uh, uh, um, the graphic novel industry arose, right? Um, so it wasn't always, it wasn't just anymore the direct market. So knowing what you guys know about the industry, what is something you'd like to see change in either industry? Well, I guess I can go first. I think one thing that needs to change is um, discoverability. Because in the old days, the way that people found and bought uh, graphic novels or comics would typically have been going to a bookstore or a comic shop and buying at a retail location. And I don't know what it is in the direct market, but it's probably actually quite could be quite different in the direct market. But in the book market, more than 70% of book sales are online now. So people are shopping on Amazon or on other um, websites and buying books there. Um, but the but for somebody who's just, a, you know, who's not an industry industry insider, who's just looking for a good book to read, it's so hard to find good stuff because it's just a mess you know it's like the signal to noise ratio is very bad on the internet um so i wish there were like if if i was could find an entrepreneur out there <laughs> to start something new what i would love for them to do is start a platform that helps people find the books that they would love um so and i and i think Another thing that's happened with the internet is that we're getting fragmented more and more into these niche communities. And it, when it comes to reading, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, if you really love, you know, gothic horror, you're a very different type of reader than if you really love Garfield <laughs> or something like that, you know? And so the type of person who's looking for gothic horror is not going to be, want to be in a space with the type of person who's like, Garfield is my jam. <laughs> So I feel like we need different little like niche communities that help people find the stuff that they really love. Yeah, hundred percent to what uh, Jenna just said. Uh, I think accessibility needs to change uh, with the amount of entertainment these days being like just unimaginably uh, high. The amount of things you can watch now on the internet and get into on the internet. Uh, people need to kind of need to be able to pare down easier uh, what they would like. Um, and so I fully back what uh, Janet just said. Um, I also think that uh, uh, kids these days, I sound like an old man saying this, but uh, kids these days need to uh, be able to know that comic books are still a thing. Um, you know, they do read, I know kids do uh, read, you know, kids comics and things like that. But um you walk by a kid on the street, they're probably on their cell phone looking at TikTok or something like that. And, you know, I was uh, outside the other day 
uh, just reading a comic book uh, in the park and some kids walked by and they looked at me like, what is that guy doing? <laughs> you know, this grown man watch looking at a comic book, like a, this colorful little floppy book in his hand. And I think uh, it kind of lit, I, I believe it lit something up in their, their imagination. Say, like, I could do that too. Why don't I do, do that? You know? So, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll add something to that, to that pot. Um, we need to come up with a with a business model that works for uh for for floppies and maybe works better for also traditional. I mean, I think traditional book publishing it's 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 base it's it's hit or miss, right? It's a crapshoot, right? You know, I mean, um, but um, but I but at least um that that industry is pretty good at finding audiences. And I think the direct market needs to get better at finding new audiences, because I think the direct market is mainly catering to an aging uh, fan base, and it's and and it's it's dwindling. And so I think it, I think the direct market that the whole that whole industry needs to figure out a business model that works, that helps find readers, and makes it like like access access accessible as well. So anyway, so those were my questions. I have one more, but I'll save that for if if nobody asks any questions. I'm gonna have to use these in my back pocket. So uh so does anybody have anything they want to ask from the audience, please? Just raise your hand. I've hey, Char. a question. Sure, Char. Go ahead. Why do you sell your graphic novels at an expensive price? And another thing. Do you use, are you planning to use AI, artificial intelligence for your graphic novels in the future? Um, well, I guess I can answer for me. Um, I don't set the price for the graphic novels. The publishers um, set the prices. Um, oh. And in terms of AI, I don't represent AI. <laughs> I only represent human beings. So um, AI is not something that I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. I heard many people are pissed with AI. Mm -hmm. Ben, do you have and anything? And they're trying to figure out which AI is good for what thing and why and why human artists are good for another. Mm hmm so Ben, do you yeah, want to ask for, first question? Yeah, um, on my end of things, the same as Jenna, oh. I don't set the prices. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I think prices could be a lot higher these days, uh, given the cost of inflation and things like that. Books could easily, floppy books could cost easily, easily cost $10 or more, you know, or even $20 uh, with the amount of labor that goes into each one. Um, but they don't, they cost four or five bucks still, which is pretty amazing in 2024. Um, as far as AI art, um, I do not use AI art at all for my work. And I kind of, I talked about it before in the past and in other interviews, uh, that it kind of sucks the fun out of the, the room when I have something else to do all the work for me. So, you know, I think also, um, you know, back in the 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, when, when a publisher would publish a comic book, you know, they could easily, they, they were, they were publishing hundreds of thousands of copies. So I think the pre price was probably much lower because of that. And today, like a typical floppy, I what they if they sell ten thousand, they're happy. So if you have us, you know, if if you understand printing, the more you print, the cheaper it gets per unit. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also something of a factor. So thanks for the question, Char. Any other questions, guys? I think Bob G had his hand raised, and now Michael has his hand raised. So let's go with um. Bob G? Yeah. And I think Tyler had a question as well, right? Yeah, so let's go with Bob and we'll... we'll... Mine's are in the chat. Yours is in the chat? Oh, boy. Yeah. So what if a person is shy or an introvert? So you're talking about, like, promoting yourself and networking and all that stuff, right, Bob? Hmm. How can shy or introverted people join the industry? Um, well, one of one of the great things nowadays is that 
you know, you can write a newsletter mm -hmm. and you don't have to talk to other people. You can just send it out. Um, I think understanding online, um, I, I, I'm going to say marketing, <laughs> even though I know that word, it doesn't make artists feel happy, but um, that can be, that can be a pretty big strength if you know how to drive traffic to your website or your social media. Um, so that's one way. And like I said, I, I feel like you don't have to know hundreds of people. You just need to know a small core of people, score, a small core group of people that you really connect with. Yeah, I agree with uh, Jenna. You don't have to know every single person in the room when it comes to uh, MIE and the art field, you know, the direct market field. Um, if you aren't um, somebody that's outgoing, you know, that likes to socialize a lot, then um, let your art speak for you. Make a lot of it. You know, uh, you can't argue with somebody that has like thousands of comics um, that they didn't talk to anybody. They made thousands of comics and the comics kind of speak for them. Um, or just be like really, really amazing too. <laughs> I know of artists that do not talk at all on the internet. They have somebody else talk for them. You know, uh, it's either they are talking for them or they, they've gotten to the point where they can have representation like Jenna, you know, to speak for them as well. So there's a very famous example of that, which is Dave Pilkey, who's the author of Dog Man and Cat Kid and Captain Underpants and he probably is the biggest selling graphic novelist in the world right now. Um, he's very, very shy and he spends, I think, most of his time in his studio just being really prolific. What is he based out of, uh, Jana? I, I think he lives in the Pacific Northwest part of the time and part of the time in Japan. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. I think um, Tyler had a question. Tyler, I'm just going to read the questions you put on the chat or do you want to ask them? Um, I, yeah, you can read them. <laughs> okay. Uh, what materials do I submit for my graphic novel submission other than my cover letter? How important, oh my God, you gave me a lot of questions. How important are some sample <laughs> I papers do I submit a sample of the script, like a manuscript for prose books? I, and how I, do I find agents that accept graphic novels? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say all these questions are for uh, are for are for her. Uh, I just want to say I'm it's a it's an honor to it's an honor it's an honor to meet you. I've I've been on your site, uh, plenty of times and I've had many questions answered. But uh, these are is all the questions that I'm still curious about. You know, okay. Tyler, Tyler is a regular here, and he at one point he was sort of my intern, and I've never seen him gush before. Oh wow! Okay, well <laughs> that's awesome. Um, okay, so I'll take them one at a time. What materials do I submit for my graphic novel submission other than my cover letter? Um, well, usually when you're connecting with an agent or an editor, you're going to go through multi-step stages. Like in the beginning, it's like, here's a really short description of my what I'm working on. Do you want to see more? And then, well, that, that would be if you're approaching an agent. And so maybe you might... You know, if it's a cold query, well, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sort of backtracking in my head because I'm kind of like, how do people approach me? But I, I actually know there's a lot of other agents who do things kind of differently. Some, a lot of agents use a query manager, I think, which is like a digital platform that yeah. you can use to submit on, which I don't use at all. I only use email. And again, all of my clients m recently, like within the past, year or two have all been referred to me so somebody somebody that I knew said you know oh you should take a look at this person I think they're really good and then and then I said sure I'll do that and then they sent over their work um so I think I think what you need oh sorry I'm having so much trouble answering this okay um <laughs> can you tell me what you're confused about and what I just said? Does it make sense? My questions primarily concerns cold queries. Um, mm -hmm. and like, what do they, what kind of materials do they tend to ask for? Mm -hmm. 
Well, cold queries, usually people have submission guidelines and um, they usually want to see some portion of your project so they can take a look at it and decide if they want to see more. Um, that most agents have descriptions on their website or on Query Manager of what they're looking for. Although I will say that a large, large number of agents say I'm close to submissions. Yeah. And the reason they say that is because everybody in the industry is so overwhelmed. Um, and that is why word of mouth is so important uh, because basically, um, yeah, it's, it's a filtering mechanism. We're all overwhelmed. You know, we get so many emails every day and ed editors get probably 10 times as many emails as I do. And I feel like I can barely keep up with my email inbox. Um, I do know that Dan Lazar is a very well-known graphic novel literary agent who is always open to submissions. He told me that, I don't know, last year, and I was amazed because he's one of the few agents who does that. So I'm just telling you guys that. <laughs> um, I but... know there's a, I, I'm posting a link to all the recordings from this podcast. And there is, uh, we did have interview um, Susan Graham, who is an agent. And so if you watch that, I'm, I'm I'm sure a lot of these questions will be answered. Okay, well, let me see if I get, can answer any of your other questions. How important are sample pages? Extremely important. I have to see the sample pages in order to, for me to know whether or not I'm interested in talking further with the creator. So yes, extremely important. Do I submit a sample of the script like a manuscript for prose books? Oftentimes, but not always, since I work with graphic novelists specifically, sometimes I don't really need to see a script if, if the creator is sharing enough sample pages. So I really have a clear idea of how they tell a story in graphic novel format. I would always wanna see some kind of a detailed synopsis or outline so I know what the whole story is, but it doesn't have to be a full script. It could be just a detailed synopsis and then some sample pages. Okay. Um, and then. How and where do I find agents that accept graphic novels? I think one really good way to do it is to go to Publishers Marketplace, um, which is an online database of book deals and search for um, comp titles. So other books that you feel like have the same audience or tone as your own work and see um, who were the agents representing those books. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I was just, I just wanted to say that, um, man, um, I use, so I, I use manuscript wish list, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a little difficult to discern exactly which agents accept graphic novels. Um, I was, I mean, I'll check publishers marketplace out, but I was wondering if there was a way to, uh better uh, um, streamline the search for agents that accept the graphic novel so that one if I if I submit oh uh, if I submit one to an agent and they and they're like why well, we I don't accept graphic novels I just don't yeah. want to make that mistake yeah 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 publishers marketplace is probably a lot better than manuscript wish list uh, okay. I, I agree with you it's hard to find who is interested in graphic novels on manuscript wish list the thing with publishers marketplace is that you do have to pay for it I, I think it's like $30 a month or something like that. But what you could do is you just pay for one month and then you just go in there, do a ton of research, download everything onto a spreadsheet and then cancel your subscription. Okay, That's what I would recommend. And then okay. the other thing is there is an, a creator out there named Nikki Smith, I think, who maintains a list of all the agents who work on graphic novels. So if you just Google Nikki Smith, N-I-K-K-I Smith, um, and then like agent list, you'll find it, I think. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. And so anybody else have a question? I think there's at least one more person who has a question. Uh, Michael has his hand up. I, I don't, oh, okay, there you go. Michael, go ahead. Uh, curious, uh, I know we talked a little about the, uh, the need for uh, marketing uh, needs to evolve. How do other parts of the world handle dealing with the evolution of the getting books it, to people and trying to keep the industry alive because <laughs> clearly uh, 
here in the states, like I remember, sales used to be you sold tens of thousands. That was good. Now, just selling ten thousand is considered great because, like, the Japanese manga market in Japan, I, I, I'm assuming it's still pretty good that they're selling stuff here now. Yeah, that's sort of the million dollar question. I would say everybody is, I think the internet has upended the whole media landscape. And in fact, I think it's in the middle of transforming our economy. Um, so everything, like, I think the um, traditional book publishing business model is becoming harder and harder to maintain. So everybody is trying to figure out. It kind of goes back to what I was saying about discoverability. I feel like that is the number one problem right now in the industry. All right. So Marcel has a question. Have you worked on any interdisciplinary um, works, work, work across fields, works across fields? And are there special considerations regarding publication? My interest is in graphic medicine, so there's a foot in medicine. Yeah, um, I have one client, um, Tracy White, who uh, published a book called Unaccompanied, which is, I guess I would call it graphic journalism in a sense, because it's about unaccompanied minors who are seeking asylum in the United States. And she interviewed um, a lot of um lawyers and caseworkers and um, activists and um, people like that to assemble this book. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the sky's the limit. You really can do anything you want. <laughs> um, so, and I think graphic medicine is a fascinating field. There's a whole graphic medicine conference that's now been going on for several years, I think, um, an annual conference. I have never been, but I know it's really thriving. So, um, so I don't know, special considerations regarding publication. I think the more niche you're working, the more difficult it might be to, to get a book deal at a big publisher. So you might end up having to work with a much smaller indie publisher, which might mean you have to figure out how to make it work without an advance or with very low advance. Um, but I think that that actually applies to people even who aren't doing interdisciplinary work. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's a tough market for everybody. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Joseph Lynch, you have a question. Hi, yeah, um, Joseph here. I'm zooming in from Australia. Thanks, Ben and, and Jenna. Um, I just had a query, Jenna, about um, with with the clientele that you work with, um, how do you go about framing market forces and market trends in, in, in when you're working with them in terms of how they establish um, a body of work within a niche and, and um, and how that relates to meeting what publishers are actually wanting to buy. How do you manage those conversations in terms of encouraging oh. people to follow a trend or not? Um, because mm -hmm. it's all depending on who's going to buy. Yeah. Um, it's a very tough question. Um, honestly, for me, this year has been really tough. The market has, I, I, I think publishers right now are just being super conservative. I think they overbought during the pandemic and there's, you know, there's inflation, there's supply chain problems. There's like a lot of issues, um, falling sales. So they don't want to take risks. They want something that's proven somehow. Um, but the flip side of it is that as an individual creator, you could go to Kickstarter, you can self-publish, you can do whatever you want, you know? So I, the first thing is like, I feel like it's very, very hard to write to the market, you know, or like try to create something to sell it. Um, so I, I pretty much for the most part say you, you just have to write what's in your heart. You have to do what you really want to do and then figure out a way what's the right path for that project. 
And maybe the right path for that project isn't a traditional book deal. Maybe you need to um, do it yourself somehow and, and slowly build it up and, and build up your career to the point where you get noticed. And then maybe you could take something that you originally self-published and then do a deal with a traditional publisher, or maybe you do something completely different and work with a traditional publisher. I do have clients that I have tried for years to sell their projects and I have not succeeded. I still believe in them. I still think they're awesome. But I basically am like, we're just going to have to figure out another way. You're going to have to do a Kickstarter. Has it ever been a scenario where you get a note back from a publisher that they say like, we would publish this if this one variable changed and then that's something oh, yeah. you work through with your clients? Yeah, yeah quite. Uh, off, we would often call that a revise and resubmit note or email so um basically they'll say I, I like the project but there's this one aspect to it that isn't working if they're willing to revise it I will take a, another look at it yes that happens great great thank you so much let's take one more question from the audience and um I might ask one more question and then we'll call it at night anybody Aisha has a oh, question there you go. um from Aisha I am a freelance literary editor and I want to edit kids' comics. What would be the best way to get Thank into you. the industry? Big Well, um, I think that you mean, I guess it sounds like you want to get a job in editorial um, at a publishing company working on kids' graphic novels. Me. I'm a big fan of informational interviews. So basically, if you have any person you know who works in kids' um, graphic novels, um, ask if they know somebody you could talk to at, at any of the companies you're interested in working at. And then just um, tell that person you're looking just for an informational interview. You just want to hear about what their job is like, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. Because oftentimes people are surprisingly willing to do like a 20 minute conversation with you. Um, and and then sort of, okay, I'm I, this is literally how I got my job at Scholastic. Um, so you, you kind of play a game of telephone. So you talk to one person and then they say, well, um, oh, I had a lovely time meeting you, with you. And then you say, is there anybody else you can think of who might want to talk to me? Um, and then you contact that person. You say, this person told me to contact you. Um, so with me, the way I got my job is that I knew one person in New York City who was an illustrator and I talked to him and he gave me the name of, I can't even remember who it was. It might've been his publicist or something like that. I talked to that person. And then she gave me the name of somebody who was in the marketing department. I talked to that person and that person gave me the name of an editor and I talked to that person. And then that person remembered me a couple months later and contacted me and said, there's a job opening. Maybe you might want to apply for it. And that's how I got my job. Yeah. Informational interviews are awesome because even though you're interviewing them, they're sort of interviewing you too. Yes. Yes. And it's the reason why they're so good is because it's not like they're not feeling that much, that pressure. Like I have to find you a job. It's just like, I want to hear what your job is like. But they remember you and then you follow up and you say thank you and, and maybe you could keep in touch with them a little bit. And they'll remember that you were proactive about seeking mm -hmm. out the informational interview. So let me ask my last question then we'll call it a night. Um, what are some qualities that one needs to make it in this industry? So let's start with Ben. Uh, right off the bat, you have to have thick skin. You know, it's uh, like Jenna said before, it's not an easy industry to uh, not only get into, but to stay into, you know. Um, so, yeah, thanks again. I would say definitely, uh, you know, always be self-improving. Um, even though I'm like in Marvel Comics, doing DC Comics and a bunch of other stuff, um, I'm always looking to self-improve. I'm looking to take classes this fall, um, maybe online or something like that. Just to kind of build my skill set, always be, be improving. You know, um, and uh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. What was the the that first part of the question again, Ramon? Just some some qualities that oh, people qualities. Yeah, in, yeah. This, in this industry. And I have to say, nobody's ever said that before. The whole improving thing. Yeah, yeah. Always right. be self improving. All the greatest artists you've come across, they've um they've done the same thing. They're always looking for the next best thing with their skill sets. Um. 
you know, like we said before, you know, um, just get out of the house, you know, and be people, you know, make friends in the industry, uh, not only in industry, but like just in life in general, you never know when, you know, you may come across somebody that would come, you know, come in handy down the line in your field or might want to be in your field. So, yeah. Let me just add to that about being social. Um, somebody asked earlier about what if you're an introvert? It's so easy to 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 network and build relationships on on online on Facebook without having to actually talk to them face to face. So I would say about a good like two thirds of my network are people I've met on Facebook, and I just like comment and just make you know just make sure you're like liking and commenting so that they remember you. You don't need to 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 be in their face to be in person. Sure. So yeah, the, the way the internet is now these days. I'm sorry for reminding me to cut you off. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it's just it's more people on the internet or just you know artists, celebrities. Everyone's more accessible these days. Um, when I was coming up, that was not possible. So you know, please take advantage of that the most you can. You know, um, reach out to people that you admire. You know, they're most likely uh, email away. You know, so. Thanks. So Jana, um, what's your take on the on the question? Mm -hmm. Well, I, Ben, I want to say I love your answer. I, <laughs> I, I, I love learning too. Um, so yeah, I'm always if I can get the chance to take a class, I'm. I have to try to prevent myself from taking too many classes because I always want to take more. Um, but yeah, persistence. I, I don't, I'm going to guess many people have said that when you've asked this question, Ramon, but I do think persistence is one of the number one things you need to succeed in this industry. All right. So with that, I would like to uh, close this out, but I do want to just sort of like just tell you guys about what's coming up next. It's next week. I usually schedule these things two weeks apart or one month apart, but lately... I've had so many people opportunities to bring guests on that I've been doing them every every two weeks. But this month, for some reason, I scheduled it for one week apart. So next week we have David Boer, who is uh, an illustrator out of I'm not an illustrator, a writer out of California. Um, and I think when I met him, he was working for Vault, and now he's doing stuff for the bigger companies. So it'll be an interesting conversation. And it's not on the meetup yet, but uh, coming in September we have. Um, we have Stephanie Williams, who is also an illustrator, and Ariel Hovelanos, who is also an illustrator. And then we have an editor. I'm, I'm bringing an editor uh, next next month. It is, let me just, Kristen. Um, I saw her post an article and it was really good. And I thought, oh, this would be great conversation. Kristen Simon. And also Sora, Sora, what's her, I can never pronounce her last name. Sora Sung, there you go, who's also an illustrator. So all that's coming down the pike. And again, I'd like to thank Ben and, and uh, Jana for coming in tonight. So let's all give them a nice round of applause again. And I've gotten much better at posting these things finally within a week or two after they've we've we've done the interview. So hopefully by next week, I'll have this online. Yes, oh. uh, one, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, Kids Comics Unite is going to do our Pitch Fest event again in early 2025. It's a competition uh, for graphic novel pitches for aimed at kids or teens. Um, so that, that'll be happening in February and March of next year. You want to put your, the link to, to your website, Jana, in the chat? I, I did. It's uh, Kids Comics Unite. Dot com. I misspelled it the first time I wrote it. Oh, I didn't see it. Tyler, you have something to say? Um, yeah, I was just one thinking. Um, could you could we sh share? Is it possible for us to share our websites and social media with uh the, the with tonight's guests if we want? Sure, just go ahead. I'll leave. Uh, we'll we'll take a minute. Everybody want to post whatever link they want on the. Yeah, on the I can copy it. I'll copy it if you put your link in the chat. And okay. thank you so much all for coming. And again, um, is there anything else I need to go over? I think that's it. So David Booher next week. I think it's Wednesday. Okay. And everybody's putting their their links on the... Oh, cool. I'm going to copy all these down too as well. 
Yeah, I have Omar and Michael. All right, um, I think that's okay, think Joseph. That's okay. Ramon, do you do this every week? No, we usually we used to do it once a month. Now we're doing it every two weeks. Mm, wow, but, that's cool. um, yeah, if you go to that page that I put down, there's a link at the very bottom to join the meetup group. Okay. Schedule them. So I schedule them on meetup, then I post them on my website. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Tyler, I got yours. Uh, ben? Yeah, I'm adding mine now. Um, okay. It took me a minute to kind of figure out how to add it to the chat. I don't do these too often. All right. It should be coming in now. Okay, got it. All right. I think that I think we got everybody, right? Well, I guess I should put my um agency. That's my agency website. Awesome. Again, let's give a nice hey, round of applause to Ben and to Jenna for coming out tonight. All right. Uh, I think I've I've copied everybody's. Yay. Awesome. <laughs> And, Thank you. Um, and someone suggested we used to do these things uh, during COVID. We used to do these these co-working sessions like once a week, you know, so I might schedule something like that, but I might wait until after the con season. <laughs> so, so if you guys are interested, okay. Again, thank you very much. Right. You okay. Nice okay, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care.